Okay, and now we turn to Nahla Mahmood, who has experience from Sudan. She has worked on environment and on human rights, and she's involved with the One Law for All campaign. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is working. Okay, I usually get excited when I'm given a mic, so do let me know if I get a bit shouty. Um, right, so here in the West, we, we, we know about all the human rights violations happening elsewhere. We know about the um, freedom restrictions, specifically in, in Islamic states and Muslim-majority countries. Um, we know about the discriminative um, laws against women and girls, the less rights they're offered, and the less economically uh, economic political and um, social position they're offered in society. We know about um, the homophobic culture fostered by these laws um, and the, host the hostility against L LGBT people. We know about the disgraceful uh, apostasy laws and how they punish people. They're, they ill like, illegalize uh, renouncing, criticizing Islam and um, they're punish they punish people uh, by deaths, public flogging, and imprisonment. Um, so we, we know all this, and we, we feel really bad, we feel sorry for people in these countries, and we genuinely want to help. So we sign petitions, we share on Facebook, we share on different social media platforms, different, um, different sort of platforms, and we, yeah, as I said, we genuinely really want to help. On a governmental level, um, less genuinely, the same discussions are happening. So there are discussions about how to influence foreign aid, how to force sanctions, and how to, um, does that, does that the thing? yes, and, and starting wars actually, sending troops overseas to defeat the extremism and, and uh, terrorism elsewhere. So we're thinking about all this elsewhere, and we, we're, we're thinking about solutions to help these people where these things are happening. What we don't tend to think about is what is actually happening here in the West. And I think, well, if we thought about it for a minute, you, you, you'll say, well, we don't really have things happening in the West. You know, it's a modern society, we have strong civil values, and we have the laws to protect these rights. So there's really nothing we should complain about. In theory, is it, I, I'm, I, I'm, I actually need to, or actually, I'm, um, if we thought about it for a second, in theory, um, this will be, sorry, I need to put the mic. Um, if we thought about it for a second, is this true? In theory, yes, it is, because yeah, as I said, it's a modern society and we have the laws to protect them. In reality, it's a big no. And I, um, particularly when it comes to Islam, and I'll be explaining this using um, some examples from my experience here in the UK and some cases I came across. So no complicated intellectual analysis, just my observations. And, and the patterns which emerged. So I came to the UK 2010. I came to the UK 2010, uh, pushed by um, lots of social political complications back in Sudan, um, mainly religion as one of the factors. And I live now in the UK, and you'll see me saying lots of we, we, because I, I am part of the West now. Um, and if I, if I took a moment to think about how I felt the first time when I was exposed to the, to the, to the reality of Islam here in the West, I would say I was really, I was really shocked by the huge amount of um, conservative Islamic culture and Islamism, especially among young groups, those who've been born and brought up here. Um, I've been exposed to the Sharia, Sharia courts, 85 Sharia courts around the UK, which are supposed to be operating under the Arbitration Act, but in reality, they are um, operating as parallel legal systems. Um, forced marriage, and they're forced marriage to, to girls eight, nine, including girls eight, nine. And um, there's an estimation by the Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organization in 2010 that 30 girls in the bar of Islington alone has been forced to marry under Islamic traditions. Uh, we've heard about the university's UK guidelines on segregation. Um, um, when it comes to Islamic events, if the speakers or the organizers wish so, we've heard about the law, um, the law society and their Sharia compliant rules, basically saying, um, here's how you legally discriminate against women and give them less rights. Oh, the niqab, why is that, 
okay, I'm really bad, you know, you need to use my hands. Um, and then you go, why is that even a debate? I, I have no idea. It's, also, it's even debated under choice. Really? I mean, if you think about it, you have, um, this, is, this, is, this is a code to isolate women socially, politically, and physically from the wider society. And with the same logic, um, if it's choice, you have the um, domestic victims who could be choosing to, sit, to stay in such a, to, to stay in an abusive um, situation because, you know, they're happy, they're okay staying there. And uh, people could also choose to be slaves, you know, if they're genuinely happy and they're okay with that, they could choose, you know, it's their choice. So it's, it's, it's a bit weird. But the most scary one, I would say, the most scary attitude I've been, uh, I've, I've seen or, or sort of observed is this aggressive attitude toward those who renounce or criticize Islam. And um, this, this, part, this is particularly um, for those, yeah, as I said, who renounce or criticize Islam or certain parts of Islam. So it includes ex-Muslims, atheists from different backgrounds and Muslims as well, liberal Muslims who challenge the traditional norms um, in their communities. Um, a survey by Policy Exchange in 2011 investigated the perception um, of a number of Muslim communities toward the, the, the death penalty. I do think about this. 34%, so that's about a third of those interviewed, eight, 16 to 24, really young, thought that um, apostates should be killed. This is in the UK, this is not elsewhere. Um, and that's really scary. It's really, really scary. If you think about w w what's gonna happen in 20 years time when these young kids are in, in, in decision-making positions, you should be scared. You should be really scared now. Um, this goes along with the number of other uh, documented cases. So I have the case of, of Tom Holland and the threats he received for his documentary, The Untold Story About Islam. Um, we have um, the threats to, directed to the atheist, secularist, and humanist uh, society at UCL for the Jesus and Muhammad um, image on, on uh, cartoon on their Facebook page. We have the intimidatory remarks to, the, um, to Ray's Morgan, who was 17, two years ago, um, uh, for his Jesus and Muhammad drawing as well, and he was threatened to be suspended from school. At the Council of Ex-Muslims, we have we do advertise a number of events in very close circles because we do fear that they could be attacked. Um, so if, you, if we try to understand why is this happening, um, a, number of, a, number of, um, a number of factors appear. So as I said, I'm just gonna be drawing from my four years experience here in the UK. So the first thing, really bad with mics, I really needed something hanging here. Right, so the first thing, um, the cowardness of, of the left and the liberals, and I'm really frustrated by this, I have to say, frustrated and disappointed. Um, they tiptoe, thank you. They, they keep tiptoeing around things, very apologetic, justifying this attitude under no offense, respect to their beliefs, multiculturalism, fighting Islamophobia, all nonsense. And um, the problem with this is that when you, have, when you lack a rational group to address people's fears and, 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 and problems, actual fears and problems, you, you, you create a niche which is filled by the far right. These are the loud voices we hear outside, and quite loud, and um, they're the ones who are addressing the issues but obviously with lots of bigotry and racism toward Muslims and immigrants. So the liberals and the left are not only being hopeless in addressing the issue, um, but they're also guarding, they're guarding these attitudes by, um, by, by, justify, by, by labeling everyone who's trying to, or who dares to criticize or take this stand by being Islamophobe and um, promoting anti-Muslim prejudice. In other words, they're siding with the Islamists. Um, so shame, big shame on the liberals, big shame on the left. Um, I had a Channel 4 interview last year where um, I criticized Sharia law. Oh my goodness, that's two minutes. Right. Um, yeah, so I criticized Sharia laws and um, I publicly announced that I'm an ex-Muslim. Um, 
and I received lots of death threats. But also, there was a, a tech fair campaign organized against myself, and it hugely affected me, uh, affected my family back in Sudan really, really badly, and I had to move places for security issues here in, here in the UK. So um, the police blamed me, basically. They gave me an alarm, a heart-shaped alarm, um, to, to scare the extremists. Um, yeah, but I've also contacted, because the, the, the campaign was organized by a Lib Dem member, a Liberal Democrat member. So I contacted the Lib Dems, and they were so defended about it, they closed the case. Um, and actually, well, I don't have time to quote some of, some of their responses, but they, they were very defendant, and they just basically closed the case. Um, their Majid and Noah's um, campaign as well, um, who tweeted that Jesus and Muhammad cartoon have been, received lots of death threats. Again, uh, a pick free campaign organized by another Liberal Democrat member. So there's something with the Liberal Democrats. Um, one of the other factors, I have to jump a couple of things, but the other factors, so we have the, lib the liberals, the stand of the liberals and on the left. Second, we have the media bias, and, and, and particularly the, med the debate shows, where they need two different opinions, and um, obviously to, to create this sort of excitement, engagement with the audience, but the ones who always present the other side, uh, debating the liberals, would usually be conservatives, because this is how you create sort of tension. Um, so the liberals, the secularists, never get to to, to, to speak out and, and to present themselves. Um, so in a way, the media is also promoting, uh, giving platforms only to the conservative views and voices. Um, it also justifies censorship. So everything that has to do with um, offending religion is censored. We do remember a couple of things. We have the um, question that's been dropped out from um, the BBC free show debate about gays and Muslims. Um, it's been censored. Um, there are a couple of other things. Tom Holland's documentary haven't been allowed the second broadcast because of the complaints it's received. Um, there are a number of other things, but I'm afraid I have to skip that. The last thing that I, I, I think was quite clear as well is multiculturalism. I'm glad that yesterday is being pointed out as well as one of the issues here. Um, the, the integration policy was one of the very um, annoying documents to read through. Um, as, as, as a migrant myself, this is the document that this is, these are the guidelines that the government have put for me to integrate to the wider society. And it basically just boxes me in either being very tra having traditions or being religious. Otherwise, I can't integrate. I can't be just a person with human values. I have to, I have to, be, I, I have, to have traditions or I have to have a religion. Um, faith schools and mosques. This is sort of my, I'm going to conclude. Faith schools and mosques. Uh, the, all, I'm also glad that we had yesterday some very powerful testimonies from, from um, speakers who've been into schools here in the UK. Um, I've spoken to a number of kids, a number of kids here involved in, 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 in schools or at, go to mosques, and they're, they're saying the exact same things that we have been told back in Sudan. Um, gays are monkeys, apostles should be killed, being gay is haram, all these sort of things. Where do they bring this st stuff from? And um, I think uh, there are also lots of questions to ask about. We had uh, the, the, the recent estimations of the Home Office for um, young groups who've got involved, to, uh, who who've, uh, went to fight with ISIS, was between 300 to 500. There's a huge number. Why? Why, why, do, why do these young kids do not, not feel integrated? Why do they feel, is there an identity issue? So I think we need to think about it as well. Um, Right, yeah, so just to, to, to sort of conclude, I think that I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of questions um, and things to think about. So with regard to the liberals and progressives, um, where do they stand from extremism in this country, not elsewhere, in this country, and the causes of extremism? Because there are lots of debates about, you know, the, these kids who went to ISIS to take their passports and nationality, but is, there's no discussion about why they got to be in that place in the first place. Um, and uh, with regard to freedom of speech, is it, is it actually a free country? If so, where do, we, where do we stand from free speech? Is there gonna be a law at some point to um, criminalize threatening and, 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 and inciting hatred against uh, those who criticize and um, renounce Islam? Education and schools, um, is it monitored? What is taught in our schools? 
who's monitoring it. And it's not only that the formal education, it's also the extra uh, curriculum activities. So that includes mosques, uh, Saturday community schools, um, extracurricular activities. Are these monitored? Who's monitoring them? Whose responsibility is it? These are all things we need to think about. Um, and also, if something is taught not in English, in another language, how is that monitored? Because they're also double speech, especially when it comes to like uh, speaking about Islam. There are specific terms that are context dependent. So we need to think about that as well. And finally, the, the young groups. Um, and um, we need also to, to, to provide sort of a, I don't know, a platform, an envi welcoming environment to get them to speak um, openly, share their fears, and, and also try to understand um, um, the, the issues that got them to, to get to this place in the first place. Uh, particularly the second, uh, second migrant generation, because there are lots of identity issues. Who are they? Are they British? Are they, are they uh, do they have the identity of their, of their parents? So, Lots of things to think about. Okay, 30 seconds. Right, I'm gonna leave you with just two very final things. Uh, so, two things to do. I know there are lots of depressing stuff going on, um, but we still can change. So, we have the elections coming up. Um, we need to contact local councillors, MPs, um, and, and, and ask them where they stand from these issues. Um, and hold them accountable to that. Ask them where they stand and hold them accountable to it. The second thing is that this is a great conference. We have lots of people coming from different organizations. It's a good place to network, but it's also important that we change all these debates into something on ground. So there are a couple of projects. I think Secular Space, was it? The Space for Secular, Center for Secular Space had a good project for monitoring those who've been, um, those who, who have uh, been subject to hate crimes here in the UK because of their religion. So that's a good one. The Council of Ex-Muslim have a couple of, couple of these projects as well. So that's something we could sort of partner up in. Uh, lots of the speakers yesterday and today have received death threats. So maybe we could think of trying to build a big case and, and sort of influence the law if we could. Thank you. <laughs>